It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is Inseparable. Inseparable, defined as unable to be separated or treated separately. Uh, impossible to separate, the same, one and the same, incapable of being separated or disjoined. I don't know if you've ever seen this. For some reason, this sticks with me. Uh, they'll take three, three little ficus trees, and they're still bendable. And if you've ever seen, anybody seen them weave these three into, braid them into one? Anybody seen this? So at first, you can see the, the trunks, and you could probably still separate them. But as those trees are left together, the three of them in that pot, they literally grow into one trunk, and they are inseparable. You will destroy the three trees that have become one if you try to tear them apart. So you get to a place where you cannot separate it anymore. Um, a synonym for the word inseparable is actually in our pledge allegiance to the flag. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, a lot of conversation now about how much liberty there is, maybe even more than that, how much justice there is. But in spite of that, and in regard to the flag, which the one nation under God, the under God part didn't get added till I think it was 1954, uh, President Eisenhower added that because of the threat of socialism, communism, and wanted to make sure, which I think it would be almost impossible to add under God to anything. We're trying to get God out of everything, it seems, nowadays. But that phrase was added, and the point of that statement was that it is a nation that is indivisible, inseparable. Uh, now, at times, it looks like it's about to come apart. And where it's not three ficus trees or two ficus trees, or any, it's just a mess. Uh, and yet, you have one flag, you got one nation, and if we hang in there together, a nation could also be inseparable, the states stay together. So we're going to take a, a shot at Romans 8. Uh, if you were to go back to Romans chapter 7, a lot of conversation there. This is Paul writing this letter to the Romans, and he's going back and forth with his struggle with sin. So you say, well, I'm, I became a Christian. I still struggle with sin. Welcome to the party. Okay, so that is going to be this tension. The thing I don't want to do, I do. The thing I do, I don't want to, you know, it's this, who will deliver me? And thanks be to God, it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. So you're not going to do it without Jesus. Without the Spirit of God, you are not going to live the life that he intended. But it is, it is possible to be a Christian and struggle. Okay? Hopefully what happens is the undulations of the struggle smooth out and it's less and less highs and lows and you're walking with God and it's a little, it's a little more consistent and stable. So Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Are you walking according to the flesh, and what does that mean? This is your flesh. This, this body that I live in is my flesh. This thing gets me in trouble. Okay? Appetites, the flesh, what your eyes see, what your ears hear, where you want to go, your, what you want to eat, just things that you want to drink, put in your body, put on your body. We get This flesh says, well, I need all this outside stuff to make me happy. But when the Spirit of God moves into this flesh and overcomes your flesh, then it's, you're, you're not just stuck in this dead, dying body. Now you have God himself alive in your body, and that changes all the possibilities. So if he is in you, you're in Christ, Christ is in you, then you have power over that sin. I just was able to say no to what's been running my life my whole life. 
There is no condemnation. There's no sentencing. There's no, um, you're out. You know, you're, you're, you don't have that going on anymore. You say, but I still feel condemned. Now, this is something, Claude, the old man that helped me. Who can condemn a child of God? God, it's God who justifies. All the devil can do is accuse. No one can condemn a child of God but a child of God. So if, you've con if you feel condemned, you have condemned yourself. You are not condemned. You say, but I, I feel bad. I've done wrong. Okay, well, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, but don't condemn yourself. He's not condemning you. Why would you condemn yourself? Let him clean up the mess and keep moving. So there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And then verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So he comes in a body, the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You can't have Jesus move in your house and your house not change. It's just not possible unless you've got him locked in the basement in some little dark room, you know, where he can't come out and run things. Keep reading. Um, verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh, so you say, well, how would I know if that's me? People that live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What do we spend our time on? What do you spend your day thinking about? Things of the spirit or of the flesh? Is your whole day eaten up with, what am I going to eat next? That's why fasting is so powerful. You want to know how strong the flesh is? Just fast for one day. Your flesh will scream at you. Have you lost your mind? We want food. We want alcohol. We want weed. We want whatever it is that you're fasting and shutting down. They go, dude, you don't run this. I run this. And I want what I want when I want it. And God says, okay, are you going to yield to that or are you going to yield to me? So how do you yield to God? One obvious way just out of these verses, those who live according to the flesh set their mind, minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So are you thinking about the things of the Spirit? What does God want for me? What is, what is he after today? What is his will for my life? Am I just going to blow up another day and, and waste, waste it like it, nothing even happened? Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You've got to pick a plan. Death, life, and peace. Everyone says they want life and peace, but they don't want to pick the plan that results in life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can be. So the carnal mind is not on God's side. You have put, you've said, okay, God, I'm not with you anymore. I'm flipping this around. I'm against you. I'm your enemy now. And I want things you don't want. And you declare that he is your enemy. You don't want God as your enemy. The carnal mind sets it up that way where you're in a battle with him. You're going to lose. You never win that battle. Verse 8. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're completely in the flesh, that means you're not even a Christian, you cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he is not his. So very simply, you got to ask yourself th this question. Does the Holy Spirit of God live in my body, in your body? If he does not, you are not his. 
period. I'm going to be a nice person. It won't, it won't help. I'm not saying be a mean person. My life's going to go better if you're nice. Eternity's not going to go any better for you if you're just being nice. So if his spirit does not live in you, you say, well, I'm not sure whether he's in me or not. Um, all I can tell you is this. Once you figure this out, you will know that he's in you when he's in you. You cannot have God on board inside you and not know that. So if you're not sure about that, get that figured out. And if Christ is in you, verse 10, so now you're talking back to Christians, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So if you are a Christian, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, You've literally got the same Holy Spirit as a Christian living in you that raised Jesus from the dead. He raises dead people from the dead. And we are dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible says. So you're spiritually dead, but all of a sudden Jesus moves in, and now you've got life in a dead body. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. We do not owe not to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live the way you're intended to live. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So you say, well, am I, am I in God's family? Are you being led by the Spirit of God? Or do you have no interest in that? You're not his child then. Get in his family. I want to be in his family. Get in his family. How do you get in his family? You say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I've, I, I can't be good enough. I believe Jesus died on the cross, was buried, raised from the dead to pay for my sin, to offer me eternal life, abundant life. I'm asked, I accept eternal life. I accept the forgiveness of my sins. Come live in me, through me, change me. I want to be your child. And he moves in. And you go, ooh, I got my ticket. Now I can live like hell and go to heaven. I wouldn't try that. You can try that. It's not going to go well. Because before you pulled that stunt, he wasn't your father. Now he's your father. And he's a loving father. And he's a caring father. And he's a disciplinarian. And he will get your attention. 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And this Abba, Father is how Jesus addressed his father. It's basically a daddy term. It's not like, oh, father. It's like, dad, daddy, you know, you got to help me. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Um, so, the Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we're children of God. If we're children, we're heirs. If heirs, join heirs with Christ. If we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. So you say, well, there's some pain involved in that. Yeah, but when you get glorified down the road, you get to heaven, all that is worth it. And he goes on to comment on that. Um, for I consider, and this is Paul writing to this church at Rome, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall, by, which shall be revealed in us. So you say, well, I'm suffering. Think about what's coming. Don't get stuck on where you are. You say, well, I don't have this, I don't have that. This is not going well. I'm literally suffering. It's not always going to be this way. And life is so short, before you know it, you're out of here. So I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be even compared. Like, well, it's, it's not even, you can't even outweigh it. What, I'm, what I had this momentary affliction the scripture talks about is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. 
For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, even the creation. For the creation was subjected to futility or to frustration, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So literally the universe is groaning and travailing, it'll say here in a minute waiting to give birth to, to something new. For we know that the, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So you say, well, no, I don't see it yet. And this is where you're going to miss it. You say, well, if Jesus said he's coming back, where is he? This is even in the scripture. Where's the promise of his coming? If he's coming back, where is he? And they say, dude, blow that off. He said he's coming back. 2,000 years later, he's not coming back. Persevere. Because if he doesn't come back, you're going to go where he is. And when you get where he is, you'll be glad you persevered. Amen. So your hope helps you hang in there and eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Verse 26, likewise, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Okay? So you got these areas of weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, so you get to a point, you're praying, and then you say, God, I don't even know what to pray anymore. I'm so overwhelmed, I'm just in a tough spot, I don't know what to pray. And he says, I got it. Now he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit is, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit of God is never going to intercede on behalf of a child of God unless it's to bring about the will of God. Not going to happen. And we know, and so we usually verse 28 gets jerked out of here and applied to a bunch of stuff, but look how this flows. Verse 27 again, he who searches the hearts knows what the, is the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so in that context of making intercession for the saints according to the will of God, you say, well, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. What's he going to allow? What's, what's, what's coming? I don't know. But I can tell you this, family secret, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So I love you, Lord. I've been called according to your purpose. Whatever you allow to happen, I'm good with. You say, well, what if that's in suffering? If suffering brings about the will of God in your life, and that's what you're really after, you persevere and say, okay, I'll hold on. Clearly, this is more important than me not suffering. So I'll go with it. Because he's going to work it all together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. It's all done. You say, well, but I thought you're not glorified until you die and you get to heaven. You're, you, you know, you're, you're sanctified. It's a process. Salvation, when you accept Christ, it's all as good as done because it's all tied up in a person. You just haven't experienced all of it yet. So am I glorified yet? Kind of. But not actually. I'm still hoping for that peace, but it's as good as done because God said it's done. What then, and the look at this, and if you have not underlined this, you know, get you a magnifying glass and make it bigger. I mean, this is unbelievable. All of this, and then he says this. What then shall we say to these things? So given everything that you have, you have power over sin, power over death, even if you're <coughs> weak, you don't know what to pray, spirit makes intercession. Um, what do you say about all this? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he didn't withhold his own son, die on a cross, shed his blood, suffer, be buried, raised from the dead. If God is not withholding that, then what in the world do you think he's going to withhold? Nothing. If I thought I had capacity to do something for my, for my family, for my kids, the only reason if I had capacity and did not do it, it would be because I thought it would harm them in some way. Right? So you say, well, why would God withhold something? Because it's not going to help you. You think he's being a mean ogre God because he's not giving you what you want. He may be saving your life. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Don't miss that little phrase. Do you see what that just said? Who also makes intercession for us? So I am a child of God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit who lives in me, and Jesus seated at the right hand of the front, throne, the two of them are interceding on behalf of me. If you don't think the two of them can get through and get it done, it ain't going to get done. Because they got me praying in Jesus' name, the Spirit, when I don't know what to do in my weakness, he's interceding to the Father. Jesus sitting there interceding to the Father. He is for us. What's he got to do to demonstrate that he's for us? They're all pleading with the Father on behalf of us that, that his will would be done. Everybody's after the Father's will. Not my will, your will be done. The sooner you pray that, the sooner your life's going to smooth down. I'm not saying it's not going to be suffering and persecution and all that, but it's going to smooth out in terms of just the stupidity and the results of that in our lives. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. So he's not condemning you. And we've already known verse 1, there is, no, there is no, no condemnation. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? You say, well, I got tribulation. Nope. Distress. I got horrible stuff going on. Nope. Persecution. Or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Is there anything that can happen that can separate you from the love of Christ? No, inseparable. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, this stuff happens. People literally die for the, for the cause of Christ, but it does not separate you from the love of Christ. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And more than a conqueror doesn't mean you win, you, you win. I was going to say bigly, but that would make people crazy. So um, just beyond winning, more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then verse 38, and this is Paul talking to himself, I, for I am persuaded. In other words, I am convinced, no question, no doubts. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So there's nothing existing now or something that is coming in the future nor height, nor depth, as high as you want to go, as low as you want to go, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, inseparable. Now, my question to you is, can you quote 38, verse 38, with conviction, convinced from the heart? I am persuaded, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You say, well, I want that kind of confidence. You gotta be his child first. You gotta get into a relationship. So where do you do that? How do you start? You say, God, enough. I'm tired of messing with this. 
I'm tired of being afraid of life, of death, of everything around me. I need you in me, living in me, through me, and show me how this stuff works. I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin. I accept his payment for my sin. I accept the gift of eternal life, free of charge. Forgiveness of sin, come live in me, change me to be the person you intended for, to, for me to be. I thank you that I'm in your family. I'm your child. Thank you for saving me. Amen. And I repeatedly, people say, it can't be that easy. And I always say what? Easy for who? For you, easy. For him, it cost him his life. And then for those of you that say, well, I already got that. Then why do you go fooling around on God? Why do you go everywhere else, try everything else, but, go, but to him and say, look, not my will, your will be done. If you did not withhold your own son from me, why would you withhold any good thing? I know you're on my side, and now as a Christian, I know you're on my inside. It couldn't get any better. You're interceding for me. You're doing everything you can. I have to yield or it'll never work. So help me, God, love what you love, hate what you hate. Want your will more than my will. And realize that the flesh only leads to death, but walking with you leads to life and peace, and that's what I'm after. Okay, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the people in this room and beyond. And I pray that you will, Holy Spirit, do your work. Those people who just prayed a moment ago and literally you have taken residence in their physical body. You live in them and now you desire to, to transform their lives and live through them. So I pray that you would give them and us wisdom, Lord, if that's the place that we find ourselves in, your child in your family, knowing that you want better for us than we will ever want for ourselves, help us yield and trust and obey. Even if it means saying no to the flesh and yes to you, understanding that that will lead to life and peace, what we truly want on this side of heaven and then the promise of heaven coming one day and we persevere in spite of whatever the suffering may be because we have hope in the hereafter, where we will be with you forever. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for being so patient, so kind, loving us so much that you discipline us when we get out of line and causing us, wooing us back to you, Lord, to serve you, to trust you, to follow you. You're the best. And we thank you for your word and how that it speaks to our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.